Psalm 98. Psalm 98, verses 4 through 7. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Again, I want to welcome all of you and our Facebook Live audience as we come into a time of great worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for bringing us together. Thank you for this more favorable weather that, uh, that we can breathe through in this beautiful sky. Lord, we praise your holy name. We pray, Lord, that even those who don't yet know you will sense your presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit this morning. We pray, Lord, that our praises will be pleasing to you and that as we pray every week, every day, we pray that lives will be changed for the better as we come together in love and support of one another and in worship of the mighty King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we sing our praises to him. Check, check, check. There we go. Good. Testing, testing. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> All right, I want to hear everyone clapping on this first song. Get excited. I can't clap. Oh, there's a bee. Okay. Uh. <laughs> Sound effects in the mic, huh? Okay. <laughs>
Turkey Parade team. Please be seated. You know, I want to ask you this morning to consider something. When you think about the relationships that you have with friends and with family, how would those relationships be if you never talked to one another? If you have a spouse or children or grandchildren or a best friend, how important it is, how important is it to communicate with each other, to just spend time with each other, to really develop and enjoy that relationship? That's what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about prayer. Our, our relationship with God is expect, supposed to be exactly that. We're not just supposed to know about Him. We're supposed to know Him. He doesn't want to just know about you. He, want, uh, no, he doesn't want to just know about you. He wants to know you. He wants to know who you are. He wants to build a relationship with you. So today we're going to talk about one of, not just one of my more um, favorite topics, but a topic that I have a real pet peeve on, which is the lack of prayer and how we can step forward into a new realm, a new relationship, a new joy, a new happiness if we step up and spend time with the Lord. And that's all prayer is. It's talking. It's not just talking, it's listening to hear what he has to say. To give you an idea of how important prayer is, I have an illustration. There's a, there's a story of St. Peter, he's standing at the gate, ready to receive those who pass from this life to the next. And there's a long line of people that are, are coming up to see St. Peter. He's checking him in. He's kind of the, the host who's assigning homes, these mansions that are, are set aside for us in heaven. And this one gentleman, he's a pastor, and he gets up there, so he's the second in line. And so now he can hear what's going on. And the one in, right in front of him is a bus driver. And St. Peter looks at the bus driver and he says, you know what, you were a bus driver. Yes, sir, I was. He said, you know, I understand that you were probably a pretty erratic bus driver. You got people where they needed to go pretty quickly. You were pretty aggressive and they were kind of tossing and turning across their seats. But you got them with her, didn't you? I sure did. He said, okay, you see that chateau over there overlooking the ocean? That's yours. Can you make your way over there? Well done. Well done. That's your, that's your place. The minister is standing right behind him and he goes, wow, this guy was a bus driver and I dedicated my whole life to God. I did my whole life to bring others to Jesus Christ. What, what kind of place am I going to get? The minister steps forward and St. Peter looks at him and said, you were a minister. Yes, I was. He said, well done, well done. I'll tell you what, why don't you go over, you see that little shack over there? Why don't you go, that, that's where you're going to be assigned. The minister says, what? I was a pastor. I brought, I brought the word of God to so many people. Why am I getting the shack of the, the bus driver over there? He's getting the chateau overlooking the ocean. And St. Peter looks at him and says, well, you know, when the bus driver was active, uh, driving people around, he had a busload of people constantly praying. <laughs> All you did was you put people to sleep when you were preaching. <laughs> it's kind of a funny story, but it illustrates the importance of prayer. So hopefully, I'm not going to put you to sleep in the next few minutes. As we continue in our message series on new beginnings, this taking this, this uh, road trip together, Today's conversation, as we've talked about, is about prayer, but it's not just about prayer, it's about the power of partnership in prayer. It's not to say that our individual prayers aren't of fair amount of importance, because they are, but today I'm going to talk about the power of partnership in prayer. And I have two wonderful young ladies who are going to come up, and they're going to read from Acts chapter 12, 1 through 19. In fact, I think you can read from this one right here, right here. Kyla and Valerie, thank you so much. It was about this time King, that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. 
When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened by them by itself, and they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel had left him. Peter finally came to his senses. <laughs> it's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door and the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and they saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what has happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered that a thorough search be done for him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea and stayed in Caesarea for a while. And this is Acts 12, verses 1 through 19. Thank you, ladies. Isn't it wonderful to have our youth involved in, in worship on Sundays? I just love having them here. So there's a, there's a quote from a guy who's a friend of mine. In fact, he used to be my pastor many years ago when he lived in Sacramento. But he's a, a well-known speaker and, and writer. And basically what he does is he teaches prayer seminars. He leads prayer seminars. In fact, I'm hoping that sometime when he gets to the West Coast, that we could have him out here again. But his name is Daniel Henderson. He's a pastor. And uh, he has this quoted, he has this written in his book, in one of his books on prayer. But he says, people ask him, which is more important, private prayer or corporate prayer? Daniel's answer is yes. <laughs> he says, that's like asking which is more important for walking, the right leg or the left. Prayer is a, it's of paramount importance, whether it's individual or corporate. We must employ both. And, you know, I think sometimes we fail to engage in prayer, even more so corporately, because we don't always expect God to answer our prayers. But our God is a God that is beyond our, beyond our imagination, beyond our understanding. And we need to understand that he always answers our prayers. He may not give you the answer that you're expecting, the answer that you're wanting, but he will answer your prayers according to his will and his way, which is always best. So we must come to him in prayer. This story that the ladies just read, this uh, Herod that you heard about in the, in the Bible, not to confuse him, this Herod is actually the grandson of the Herod that sent Jesus to Pilate to be crucified. This Herod is named Herod Antipas. And he was committed to stamping out Christianity. 
he did everything he could with every turn to persecute Christians. He, he lived for that. And it's interesting because Christians were not hard to find. If you study not only the Bible, but some of the history books of the day, the, the Christians were not hard to find. They were out in the street. They weren't hiding, despite the fact that they were being persecuted, despite the fact they were being arrested, despite the fact that they were being executed. They weren't hiding. They were going city to city, house to house, preaching the word of God, preaching it with power and enthusiasm, because they were a people that were so committed to God, that were so engaged in prayer, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they had to speak. They had to speak out. They could not contain themselves because they were excited for Jesus Christ. And they also, because of their relationship with God, because of the awe they felt for God, the awe that you and I should be feeling for God, they had a greater fear of disappointing God than they did of the persecution, of, dis of, of the, the problems of the here and now of Herod Antipas and the, the Roman army. Their fear and respect and awe was greater for this God, this God that we worship and celebrate today. And as we've just heard in the scripture, what happened is Peter had been put in chains. He'd been cast into a dungeon. He had been cast there with the expectation that he was going to be executed as part of this, this myriad of, of attack of persecuting and destroying and, and executing Christians. They were going to make a name for him. That was the plan. But, you know, the reality that this was that this happened during Passover. And according to Jewish law, doing something like executing a prisoner, even a Christian, was work. And it was forbidden to work during Passover. Kind of a, a strange law if you think about it. It's okay to kill a Christian, but you can't do it during Passover. We've had strange laws for years. As I, as I researched this, I, I found one author who had done some, uh, some research, and he found that there are a number of odd laws in the United States, as we well know, too. For example, in Jer Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, it's illegal to serve your food, your garbage, to pigs, to hogs, before cooking it. In New Orleans, it's illegal to tie an alligator to a fire hydrant. <laughs> in New Orleans, though this is not enforced today, the law is still on the books. It's illegal for a woman to drive unless her husband ties a flag to the front of her car first. <laughs> in Tylertown, Mississippi, it's Ill illegal to shave on the center of Main Street. In Texarkana, Texas, you cannot ride a horse at night without taillights. <laughs> in Little Rock, Arkansas, you can't walk a cow down Main Street after one o'clock on a Sunday. The list goes on and on. And certainly we have peculiar archaic laws here in California too. In fact, we probably shouldn't even get started about that. Yeah. Yeah. But here they have this law that you can kill Christians, but you can't do it during Passover because it's a sacred day, it's a sacred period of time. And here is Peter. He's been cast into, pre into prison. He's chained and guarded. It says he's, he's chained and guarded by 16 people. And if you read the history books, uh, some authors equate these 16 guards to the Navy SEALs of today. One author said they were the Navy SEALs of the Roman army. They were the meanest, baddest, strongest soldiers you could possibly imagine, guarding this one man, this passive man, Peter. And Christians gathered together in partnership, just as we should be gathering in partnership. They gathered together, church, in prayer for Peter. Now, the, the history seems to show that the mindset of the people was that they didn't have a lot of hope for Peter, but they knew they were called together to pray anyway. They didn't have hope that their, their prayers would be answered, but they knew they had to come together anyway. They came together in a partnership of prayer. And Peter, who knew the Lord intimately, probably had a very, very strong prayer life, 
was so at peace with the whole thing that he's there in chains ex expecting to be executed but he's calm he's overwhelmed with the peace of God he's so calm that he just falls asleep he's got the peace of Jesus but what happens as we've read here these Navy SEALs these 16 guards they're supposed to be watching over Peter that know that they're going to face death themselves if they somehow let Peter out. These 16 guards all fall asleep through the power of prayer. They all fall asleep. And suddenly, this light shines in prison, and it's the light of the glory shining off the angel that God himself had sent to come and rescue Peter. And I can just imagine, as the scripture teaches us, Peter's laying there asleep, hardly knows what's going on, and this light's kind of hitting his eyes, and he's probably turning a little bit to the side to try and get back to sleep. And the angel's coming and it's shaking. Peter, wake up, wake up. I'm here to save you. And Peter is just so calm. He's hard, to, he's hard to wake up. But I want you to consider for a moment some things that have happened in your life. Some experiences you've had where perhaps the angel of God is coming and they're saying, wake up. I can get you out of this dilemma. I'm here to save you because... Jesus is crazy in love with you. Maybe something in your past. Maybe something you're going through today. Maybe something a friend or family member is going through. And they need to hear this word. They need for you to not only soak this up today, this message and the scripture, but to go and share it with them. Because maybe there's an angel that's coming out to shake them and say, George, wake up. Wake up. Today's a new day, and Jesus loves you. We've got to engage in prayer and never give up. We are called, church, to be partners in prayer. We're called to be partners in prayer. Matthew 18, 20. This is powerful. It says, For where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Jesus is saying, If two or more are gathered in his name, he's with us. When we pray this morning, Jesus has promised us he is here with us right now because there's more than two of us here praying. That's powerful. And what happens is we get caught up in this rut. We get caught up in the rut of hopelessness because of the problems of this world. And we fail to turn to Jesus. We fail to turn to our best friend, our confidant, our creator, who can solve it all and who cares about your problems more than you even care about them. We get stuck in, in a chain of hopelessness. We get stuck in a, a chain of tradition, of reluctance. We get stuck in a chain of self-will. We get stuck in a chain, contrary to what I preached about last week, of no expectancy. How do you think that makes the Holy Father feel? When we, when we ask of him, but we don't expect that he can deliver, or we don't expect that he cares. But the real chain breaker, people, the real chain breaker, I want you to, to take this and claim it, is prayer. And what do we see in scripture? We see prayer, and then we see results, even though they weren't really expecting it. We see results. Peter is released, and a wonderful thing happens. It says, the church will see great and mighty things. The church will see great and mighty things. So no matter what you're going through today, or your friends or neighbors, or what we feel about what the church is going through as we go through this pandemic, and we go through the, the crazy politics of inside or outside, can we meet, can we not meet, can we sing, can we not sing? And we look at other parts of the world in what we call the 1040 window, where Christians are so heavily persecuted that in order to meet, they meet in basements with candles instead of lights because they don't want the authorities to see them and come and destroy them. They don't want the authorities to come and see their Bibles and take away their Bibles. But scripture says during that time, and I can guarantee you during this time, the church will see great and mighty things if we come together in partnership and pray. And I think many of you have experienced this in your own lives. If you haven't, I invite you 
to seek that experience. I can remember at, at a previous church, my wife was going through some real struggles I may have shared with you before. This was probably 10 years ago. And she went through two or three, two or three years where she could hardly move around, she could hardly walk, she couldn't drive. We went to doctor after doctor, we went to neurologist, I think weekly, I, I can't remember, it was a while back. And they never really figured out what was going on. And one day our pastor, who was a great prayer, great prayer warrior, was always praying for everything in the world. He told the sanctuary that day, he said, right now, instead of engaging in prayer for all of these other important things, I want us to take the next few moments in silent prayer. And the only thing we're going to do is pray for Janice Hale in partnership as a church body. And I, my faith was strong, but not strong enough. I thought that was a wonderful thing, but I didn't think it was going to do much good. Several good and strong Christians in the church said, oh, that was so nice, but I know her, her situation is hopeless. But it was at that point that her life started turning around. It wasn't overnight, but it was at that point that we could see the change in her life and her health. And all of a sudden, over the next few months, she started getting well. And the neurologists, they, they put a title on what it was, and they said, but we don't know. This is just something we're assigning it to. But I know today, it wasn't just prayer. It was the power of partnership in prayer that caused the Holy Father to come down and touch my wife so that he may be glorified and we may see the power of his majesty and the love he has for each of us. Partnership in prayer is critical. Church, when we pray together, God also increases our vision. Matthew 17, verse 20 says, Because you have so little faith, Jesus answered, For truly I tell you, he's going to increase your vision here, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If we believe the word of God, how can we have doubts? How can we not live in, expect in expectation? As we say Sunday after Sunday, none of us here, none of us who know the Lord want to come through here and rip pages out and say this, this part isn't true. The entire word of God is true. And he says that nothing will be impossible. He increases our vision. Here Peter was sleeping. He was facing death, but he was asleep. But God got him out of a situation. And the story continued on, all to the surprise of the people. Next, when we pray together, God increases our passion. He increases our passion. Ephesians 16, 18 to 20 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glory of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavy, heavenly realms. When we pray together, God also increases our expectations. The irony of the story here, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of interesting is first of all the escape. There were 16 guards, and he was in chains, locked up. Yet he escaped. He escaped these guards that were the equivalent of Navy SEALs. But the real irony is this. Here he had put John to death. Herod Antipas had put John to death, but he's unable to do the same thing with Peter. Who would have imagined this? Herod himself. Herod Antipas himself would die from worms just a few months later. And then look at the final result in verse 24. Again, it says that the word of God spread. The people of God spread. The power of God spread. God, Jesus said, as we say over and over again, that he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And we can live that and enjoy that today. The word of God continues to increase and spread. And you and I have the great privilege through supporting one another and through the partnership of prayer 
to be able to be part of that, going out and spreading it, spreading the word of God, all because of the power of prayer. And we have, you wonder, well, you know, how do I, I, I pray on my own, and I, I, I guess I'm going to try and do better, but how do I engage in this partnership of prayer? Well, it says when two or more gathered in his name, so grab a friend or a family member and say, can we pray together? Or we have prayer time at 10 o'clock on Tuesdays at our Woodland campus. You're welcome to pray there. We have 5 o'clock on Wednesday evenings on Zoom here at Life Point Rio Linda. We have Powered by Prayer. You're welcome to come and join us. You get emails every week about it. You can find it on Facebook Live on how to link. And we're going to try and get together in person fairly soon. Probably have a hybrid of Zoom and in person. And you may say, well, I feel awkward praying publicly. But do as the Spirit tells you. Nobody's going to call on you to pray out loud. You can come and just listen. You can come and be fed. You can come and be there in prayerful, quiet support. But I urge you, church, I urge you to join in to the power of partnership in prayer. It is of critical importance. Again, when we pray together, God increases our expectations. Mark 11, 22 to 24 says, Have faith in God. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Finally, when we pray together, God is glorified. When we pray together, God is glorified. Ephesians 3, 20-21 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. He can do more than all we ask or imagine. That's amazing. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all all generations forever and ever. When we pray together, God is glorified. So I want to ask you, are you involved in this glorious partnership? God is looking for recruits. Will you look into his face and say, here I am, Lord. Use me. I want to close with a poem. I didn't write this. You guys know I'm not that creative. Traveling on your knees. Last night, I took a journey to a land across the sea. I didn't go by ship or plane. I traveled on my knees. I saw so many people there in bondage to their sin. And Jesus told me I should go, that there were souls to win. But I said, Jesus, I can't go to to lands across the sea. He answered quickly, yes, you can by traveling on your knees. He said, you pray and I'll meet the need you call and I will hear. It's up to you to be concerned for lost souls far and near. And so I did. Knelt in prayer, gave up some hours of ease and with the Savior by my side, I traveled on my knees. As I prayed on, I saw souls saved and twisted persons healed. I saw God's workers strength renewed while laboring in the field. I said, yes, Lord, I'll take the job. Your heart I want to please. I'll heed your call and swiftly go by traveling on my knees. The power of partnership and prayer. We're going to take just a few moments as the praise team comes before we close, and we're going to engage in the power of partnership and prayer. And I'm going to ask our staff and ministry leaders and any of you who've been anointed as prayer warriors to just stand where you are. And as you stand, uh, I'm going to ask you to pray over our congregation. You don't need to pray out loud, although you can. You can pray over the top of one another because God can discern your voices. Or you can just pray quietly. But I'm going to ask you to pray over our congregation, over our Amean congregation, 
over our congregation in Woodland and over our communities in the next few minutes as a partnership in prayer. Pray over people that you know and hear who are hurting. Pray that we become a praying church as the next, the next few minutes. And if any of you have any special prayer requests, we're not going to take the time to, to uh, ask you to voice them now, but I'm going to ask you with your heads bowed to raise your hand and the, the prayer warrior will, will just know there to pray for you. Pray for you. They won't know what it is, but God will. So let's just take a few moments in silent prayer. Father, thank you again for bringing us together today. Thank you, as Josh has just prayed, for this, this tool, this wonderful opportunity, the power of prayer. Thank you that you're not just some distant God who created us and left us and forgot about us, but wants a relationship with us that we can, we can heighten through prayer, through conversation with you. Lord, I pray, Father, for each person each person gathered here together. I pray, Lord, for your anointing. I pray for encouragement. I pray for the fruits of the Spirit on each one. I pray, Lord, as, as each one goes through the journey, the challenges, the hardships, the trials that they're facing, that you will carry them through it and that they will see you carrying them through it. I pray, Lord, as Joshua has prayed, that we won't just walk this journey and hope but this will prayerfully walk this journey, walk, walking this journey in partnership with one another and with you. Give us, Lord, a thirst to see more of your face. Give us, Lord, the discipline to engage in prayer, both individually and corporately. Help us, Lord, to do as your word says. Your word says to, to test me on this. If you're talking about giving, about our, our tithing and offering, but I know the word, as it says, test me on this, test me that you will hear us and that you will respond and that we can build a deeper relationship with you, a more powerful and loving relationship with you, a more joyful walk on this world. And I pray, Lord, not just for, for, this, for this church body, but also for the woodland body. And I pray even more for the communities that we serve. Thank you, Lord, for this great privilege of being disciple make makers. Help us to honor the Great Commission and to know that we, we can't do it on our own, but through the power of prayer, 
your word tells us when we go and make disciples of, na of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to always obey your commands that it says that you will be with us always thank you for that Lord help us to engage in prayer so we know and feel and sense your presence that much more forgive us Lord of our past bring us help us to step forward into a better future as we work together striving to make this world a better place for Jesus Christ by kicking the devil out of the world and bringing people into the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with us as we close.
Thank you, Praise Team. Thank you so much. A couple of things. One, I want to thank you so much for your love and support, for your kind words, your cards, um, your encouragement, the night, wonderful food you've brought as my wife has gone through this journey. Tomorrow is her day of uh, surgery to remove the tumor. It's the cancerous tumor that she has, so your, your prayers, our partnership and prayers are so much appreciated. Uh, I also want to remind you, I haven't had a chance to talk to our NMI director yet, uh, President yet, Christy, but Alabaster is coming up soon. At some point, we're going to schedule Alabaster, so you might want to start doubling up on those pennies and nickels and dimes and $100 bills and so forth you've been saving for <laughs> Alabaster. Um, and I want to thank again our Facebook Live audience and all of the rest who have, have joined us. The uh, children's director, uh, Deanna, has reminded me that she loves your kids, but she doesn't love them so much she, that she wants to keep them forever. So she's asked me to be sure to remind you to go on over and pick them up right after, right after church as well. So let me pray. Father, thank you so much again for bringing us together. We pray, Lord, again, that our, our time of praise is pleasing to you. We thank you that you have truly shown up as you always do and that we, we can sense enjoy and know your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless us as we go. Help us to be the church to our communities and to our family and to engage in that partnership of prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody.